Hello, my invisible friends. My name is Dr. Aldemaro Romero Jr. I'm a college professor and someone who has taught and written about genetics and the history of science. In this History of Genetics course, we will be examining how our knowledge of heredity has evolved for thousands of years. We will begin with domestication from the prehistory until 22,000 years ago. Then we will look at ancient civilizations, Greeks and Romans, from between 600 before our common era to 476 years of the common era. Then we will look at Middle Ages and Renaissance from 476 to 1650. Then we'll get into the era of the modern science. Later, we will look at the 19th century, when Mendel and his predecessors started to make a big difference in the way of we understand heredity. And finally, into the 20th century, where we're looking at how the Mendel's work was rediscovered and what kind of an impact it had in science in general. To begin with domestication, uh, let's talk about this first period as mentioned in the outline. Domestication in early times until 2200 years ago. As you can see from this chart, domestication of plants and animals have taken place since antiquity. You can see, for example, the probably the first plant that was domesticated was the rice in what is today central China, about 15,000 to 16,000 years ago, even maybe more. Then the other type of rices, the one in Africa, in Americas, uh, corn and maize, also in America, uh, flax, uh, lentils, olives, date palm, wheat, beans, and soy bean. The last one, the most recent one, about 4,000 years ago. As you can see, from very early times, humans have been developing the ability to domesticate plants for their own benefit. Then let's take a look at some domesticated animals that also began long time ago. Probably the first species of animal that was domesticated were the sheep uh, about 20,000 uh, years ago in what is today northern Iraq. And after that we see dogs, and goats, pigs, horses, donkeys, common pigeon, dog, camel, hen, bees, silk mouth, and the rabbit. As you can see in this next chart, all these domestications have taken place in many different parts of the world. It seems that every ancient civilization has been able to develop their own techniques to take advantage of wild plants and animals and make them useful for humanity. So since then, we are dealing with a number of eternal questions in genetics. The first one is, what is the nature of fertilization? What is transmitted? to a population that is responsible for conception. This seems like a very basic question for us today, but for thousands of years, nobody knew. The second one is, can living things generate spontaneously, or is a sexual union always necessary to produce new individuals? The next one is, what are the respective contributions of the characteristics of a child made by the father and the mother? Does the mother make a genetic contribution in addition to serving as the nurse of developing the embryo? Again, we know very well the answer for this, but for thousands of years nobody had any good idea. Where is the male semen form? Is there a special organ or it throughout the body? Another interesting question. How is the sex of the offspring determined? How do we know it's going to be a male or a female baby. And finally, to what extent are the heritable characters affected by use or disuse, the environment or other factors? So let's begin by taking a look of these ancient civilizations and what they believe were the answers to some of these questions. 
And that will be the topic of our next chapter of the history of genetics course, in which we will see how many myths about genetics were generated. So stay tuned. During the ancient civilizations, we can find a lot of speculation and myth about heredity. This was largely biased in favor of males, and here are some examples. Between 600 and 500 years before the Common Era, we see that ancient Greece had a tremendous interest in these kind of questions. In Homer's Iliad, for example, in the 7th century, he showed a preoccupation by early Greeks on matters of pedigree and eugenic ideas that were very popular. In the idea, for example, eliminating individuals that didn't seem very fit, including children, uh, was something that was practiced in ancient Greece for a long time. Then came Agmion of Crontona, who claimed that the semen originated in the brain. He believed that there was such a thing as a female semen and postulated that the sex was determined by the preponderance of either one. Equal amounts would cause hermaphroditism. Hermaphroditism was something that was a big deal for, for ancient Greeks. And in fact, it's something that does occur in nature, but it's very, very rare. The next one was Hippo of Regium, who postulated that semen was actually originated in the spinal cord. He also said that Children are either male or female according to whether the semen was thick and strong or weak and watery. Hippo also believed that this could only be applied for the male semen, since the female is, in his own words, discharged from the sexual organ. Later, other philosophers such as Parmenides, Empedocles of Acragas, and Democritus of Abdera also believed there was such a thing as a female semen. And Parmenides further thought that the semen was derived from the blood. Empedocles held that the heat of the womb was decisive for sex determination. In other words, a warm uterus produced males, a cold one, females. Sensorinus thought that it was the temperature of the semen, not the womb, the one that determined the sex. For him, if you have a hotter male semen, you will produce a boy that resembles the mother. If the mother semen was warmer, a girl that resembles her father. If they both have equal degree of heat, a boy that resembles his father. An equal degree of coldness, a girl that resembles the mother. These were the kind of beliefs that were around at that time. Anaxagoras, Parmenides, and the ancient Indian writings also develop what is known as the right and left theory. According to these theories, boys come from the right and girls from the left side of the body. In the same for the womb. This may be based on the old Greek belief that right was superior to the left. This was combined with Empedocles' heat theory and thus the right side of the womb was believed to be warmer. They further believe that if a sperm from the man's right side entered the right side of the uterus, a boy would be born, but if it was the opposite, then a female would be formed. However, if semen from the right entered the left side, then a male with female features would be formed, and if the semen with female characteristics entered the right side of the uterus, then a female with the male features would be formed. Anaxagoras, for example, further anticipated somewhat the theory of preformation, since he believed that a prototype of every part of every organ of the future living creature was already contained within the semen. He thought that only males produce semen, while females only play the role of conceiving. Up to the 18th century, these beliefs were maintained up to the point that many physicians even recommended that if a woman wanted to have a boy, she should lie on the right side during intercourse. Also, 
since it was believed that cold temperature made the womb to become hotter, it was recommended that if you wanted to have a boy, intercourse should take place in cold nights. Diogenes of Apollonia thought that blood was converted into semen when the thickest blood in the veins was absorbed by the fleshy parts of the body. The rest was transformed into more liquid, warm and foamy substance. Then semen was carried out to the sex organs. Hippocrates, of course, based his ideas on observations and systematized Greek medical knowledge. He and Democritus foreshadowed Darwin's provisional hypothesis of panspermia or pangenesis, meaning that tiny particles called gemmules or pangenes are given off by every part of the adult body, a line of thought derived from the school of atomism in his work, The Genitura. He also believed in the inheritance of acquired characters. Plato asserted that the semen came from both the brain and the spinal cord. He believed in spontaneous generation, also called abiogenesis, meaning that life can come from non-living organisms. He also believed that climate created different people. In other words, if uh, Africans were black, it's because they live in a very hot environment. And if uh, Europeans were white, it's because they live in a uh, cold environment. And of course, we know that's not true. Males were determined by strong sperm and females by weak ones. And also in the right and left theory. Notice already this bias towards um, male preponderance in all these ideas. And this was evidenced by several statements. For example, he said, When a woman is pregnant with twins, should either breast sag, she will lose one child. If it is the right breast, it is a male child that will be lost. If it is the left breast, a female child since the male fetus is usually on the right, the female on the left. And he also said, At puberty, depending on which testicle develops first, the individual will father boys if it is the right one, girls if it is the left. And finally, The male fetus is in the warmest place, the most solid at the right of the womb. That is why males are darker and formed earlier. They move about earlier, then movement stops, and they grow more slowly. They are more solid, more passionate, and more full-blooded because of the location in the womb where they take form is hotter. Yes, this is a good summary of the kind of things that people believe in ancient Greece. Even Aristotle, who was uh, in many ways the founder of biology as we know it today, he distinguished four types of generations, of four types of ways that life was conceived. One a, was a, abiogenesis, as I mentioned earlier, has to do with the production of life out of material substances. Bot formation, in other words, small animals being formed on the sides of larger ones, uh, also in the case of plants and crustaceans. That sexual reproduction without copulation uh, in which males and female attributes merged to such an extent that no copulations were needed. He said, for example, that hermaphroditism and parthenogenesis was occurring in plants, bees, and fishes. And finally, he did believe that there was such a thing as fertilization via copulation. Aristotle also speculated that the relative contributions of the female and male parents were very unequal. He said that the female was thought to supply with what he called the matter, and that the male the myrion. In other words, the male alone makes the seed from his blood. It contains potentially the sensitive soul and the adult form, but it contains no bodily parts, an opposing view to those of performism and pangenesis that we mentioned earlier. For Aristotle, the female contributes only the catamenia, or menstrual blood, or material whose form is nutritive soul. When the male's form has been imposed upon the female material, the somatic part of the seed is blocked away. All that is transmitted is soul, the sort of form and motion. He also said that if the fetus develops regularly, 
the father's form will be actualized. Failing that, the mothers, failing that they gain a more distant ancestors successively, until eventually the form may be merely that of the species, or even just the genus animal, that is, a monstrous birth. Aristotle criticized Hippocrates' ideas on the basis that sometimes an offspring resembled more way back ancestor than his own parents. He also asked, how can an adult that later in life will become bold transmit boldness before getting that characteristic? How to explain the inheritance of characteristics of dead tissue such as nails and hairs, or the inheritance of behavior? He also fought against the idea of miniature germs in the sperm. Aristotle thought that the right and left theory was wrong since he had found female embryos on the right side of the womb and male on the left. He did believe, though, that female peditoma, or surplus of nutrients, lacked the vital heat. He believed in hybridization to the extreme. He thought that the giraffe was a hybrid between camel and a leopard. He thought that the sperm derived from the blood that menstrual blood was the substance for the embryo and depending upon the reaction with it, certain characteristics would be expressed. Theophrastus of Erisus held that higher plants reproduce by sexual means, although this fact was ignored for many centuries. He described variation among plants and how they could be inherited. Herophilus of Chalcedon discovered the ovaries, which he termed as female testes. He also described the uterus, the cervix, and the fallopian tubes, and was interested in the relationship between menstruation and general health. He thought that the spermatic duct was the principal organ of spermatogenesis, that is, the organ that produced the sperm. Though the Romans did not contribute much to the idea of reproduction and heredity, they did develop the study of selection, breeding, fruit grafting, etc. Their time was marked with rampant superstition and mysticism as revealed in the writings of Pliny the Elder. There were many incredible stories at that time. For example, how women produce offspring related to their thoughts. In other words, women were able to shape the form of an individual based on their own thoughts. Uh, species were giving birth to totally different ones, which of course doesn't happen. Incredible tales about hybrids were also very common at that time. Then we had Ateneus of Atalia, who dealt with the hybrids. Uh, he introduced the concept of Numa, or spirit, and considered that this Numa was responsible for the generation of semen. Garden of Pergamon still believe in the right and left theory of sex termination and the vital heat ideas. And then we have a writing here from India, the Institutes of Manu. According to those writings, the female was, quote, the field, unquote, and the male was, quote, the seed, unquote. We knew bodies are formed by the united operation of the seed and the field. And in the next chapter of this course on the history of genetics, we'll be see how all ideas of heredity were maintained. So stay tuned. Hello again. In this new chapter of this course on the history of genetics, we will see how all ideas on heredity were maintained. We have writers such as St. Augustine, St. Isidore of Seville, Vindician, or Michael Celus, who largely repeated much of the same old ideas of the ancients, such as the right and the theory. The Arabs, although excellent horse breeders, just passed the Greek knowledge into future generations. So was the case of the Persian Avicenna, who is considered the father of modern medicine. Then, we look at Albertus Magnus. This German was an encyclopedist, 
a follower of Aristotle, and he made many contributions in zoology and botany. But still, he believed in spontaneous generation, in the inheritance of acquired characters, pangenesis, and the left and right theories. As you can see, all traditions die hard. He also distinguished four types of reproduction. In social reproduction, for example, among the higher animals, he thought that the material produced by the female was like a seed, differentiating that from the catamenia or menstrual in mammals. The cause of the differentiation of sexes for him was that the male vital heat could, quote, concoct, unquote, semen out of surplus blood, whereas the female was too cold to effect the change. Again, a sexist bias here. Leonardo da Vinci, the most famous uh, Renaissance man, uh, he explained that blacks were not white people burned by the sun as was believed until then. He said that black people in Europe have black descendants and that the progeny between blacks and whites were, quote, great, unquote, supporting the contention that the mother also had some sort of a sperm and, quote, potency, quote, regarding heredity. Paracelsus, this Swiss man, he said that the semen contains an aura seminalis, some sort of semi-material principle, which was, in fact, responsible for heredity. He also believed in panspermia and largely followed Hippocrates. Then came William Harvey. This Englishman coined the famous phrase ex ovo omni, which means an egg is the common origin of all animals. Thus, for him, there was no such a thing as a spontaneous generation. For Harvey, eggs had to be fertilized by the semen. He was the first to make a real contribution to the study of reproduction and heredity. He presented two possibilities for the development of the egg after it had been fertilized by semen. Either the complete material was already present and merely needed to be shaped, or the material had to be assembled and was differentiated as it was produced. The former theory is known today as metamorphosis, and the second is known as epigenesis. And in the next chapter of this course on the history of genetics, we'll we see how the modern science period represented a major change in the way we understand genetics. So stay tuned. The modern science period represents an era of new views and discoveries about heredity. For example, the Englishman Himaya grew. He suggested in 1672 that pollen represented the male element of flowering plants. Then came Rudolf Jacob Camerarius. This German scientist confirmed Grew's ideas and in 1694 published the Sexum Plantarum Epistola, in which he a designated the anthers as the male sex organs, b pollen was needed for fertilization, c the sexual reproduction in plants was equivalent to that in animals, d that the role played by wind was very important in pollinization, and E, that seeds may be produced under certain conditions even if pollination was prevented. This was a really revolutionary idea because at that time nobody thought that, what, that could be possible. Then we find Anton van Leeuwenhoek. This Dutch uh, scientist discovered the spermatozoa in 1677, but for him these were quote, worms, unquote, fertilizing agencies. Even if the former were true, do you need all that spermatozoan or just one fertilization? That was still unclear at that time. Van Leeuwenhoek, his student Johann van Ham and Nicolaas Harsucker uh, all assumed that the spermatozoan was a preformed organism. In other words, that everything that you need to see it was going to be developed later, was in the sperm. Martin Schrugge, a German, in his 1720 Spermatologia, 
again suggested that the sperm is produced in the brain. Some of the ideas that were floated early on were those of preformation and epigenesis. The question was, how can the amorphous egg develop into an adult? One explanation was preformation that maintained that the embryo was, quote, preformed, unquote, in the egg of that form that you got by growth, the adult form. An extreme view of this theory was the school that postulated the pre-existence of miniaturized adults called homunculus, somehow encapsulated in the egg. Preformationists were further divided into whether the pre-existing embryo was in the egg, they were called the ovis, or in the sperm, they were called the espermis. While Van Leeuwenhoek, Hermann Borhaber, and Hartsocker were espermis. Spallanzani, for example, conducted between 1780 and 1785 the first experiments on artificial insemination. He used male frogs dressed in little panties to allow the fluid to pass but not the spermatozoids and so how they failed to fertilize the females. The experiments were abandoned after an uproar for, quote, trying to interfere in God's process. Then we find Georges Louis Leclerc Comte de Buffon, a Frenchman, who published in 1739 in an encyclopedic Histoire Naturelle, in which he emphasized the stories of animals over abstract classification. But in there, he believed in pangenesis, and that if more males, quote, particles, unquote, were provided by the male, then it would be a boy, and vice versa. Similar ideas were expressed by René Antoine Fauchot de Roamour and Pierre Louis Moreau de Mapertuis. They were very critical of preformationism because the observation that offspring contained a mixture of characteristics of both parents, which was particularly true in the case of hybrids. Mapertuis belief in the reason behind this explanation was the presence of, quote, particles, unquote, in the semen, and the excess of particles were carried from one generation to another, which was explained that some people had more resemblance to their grandparents than to their parents themselves. Mapertuis discarded the teleological explanations of biological adaptation. He believed in the survival of the fetus and the inheritance of acquired characters, an invariation within a species from which changes can evolve. The large number of spermatozoids would include cells from previous generations, explaining thus the origin of resemblances to past generations. And then we come to the concept of epigenesis. Epigenesis believes in the gradual differentiation of the amorphous egg into an organ as an adult. This idea was originated by Caspar Friedrich Wolf, a German, who published several books about these topics. Wolf proposed that the nourishment and growth of plants depends on an essential force, or he called vis essentialis, which had the power to resemble new organs not previously existent from bubbles, which basically cells of the homogeneous substance. And in the next chapter of this course about the history of genetics, we will explain how an obscure monk changed all the views we had on heredity to that point. So stay tuned. Now we get into the century of Mendel and his direct predecessors, many of which would carry out experiments similar to the ones by Mendel, but it was Mendel's background in mathematics that allowed him to arrive to the right conclusions. First was Carl Ernst von Baer. This German scientist published in 1828 a work describing animal development in different groups that showed progressive specialization throughout development while also showing irreconcilable difference among major groups. In other words, this man was the father of what we call today 
embryology. Both Caspar Wolf and von Baer postulated that the mother supply a single uniform unit of matter or ovum, which is uh, Latin for egg, while the male supply the potency, which he called vis essentialis, again a bias favoring males. This seems to have been confirmed when Bonnet, the Frenchman, discovered in 1740 that egg of plant lice, aphids, can develop even without the presence of males. Then came Carl Linnaeus, the Swedish man who is the father of uh, tax modern taxonomy. He emphasized the sexual nature of plants. He defined species as similar individuals are bound together by reproduction. Eggs always produce offspring closely resembling parents. Hence, no new species are produced at the present time. Of course, he was a creationist, not an evolutionist by any means. He was influenced by Rudolf Jacob Camerarius, of whom we already said a few things earlier, and Sebastian Vellan. For plants, he used differences in the number and position of the stamens and the pistils of the flower. However, this sexual, so to speak, classification was somehow uncomfortable for Linnaeus and the society of the time because of moral reasons, but proved to be so useful in the way it was adopted later. In 1841, Albert Kolliker showed that spermatozoids were cells, and Robert Remack, a Polish German, uh, in uh, 1852, and Karl Kagenbauer. Uh, German also in 1861 extended those ideas to the ovum. In 1845, Johann Sirson, a Polish, uh, substantiated the hypothesis that drones come from unfertilized eggs of honeybees by uniparental reproduction, something that we call today apomixis. Oscar Herwig, a German, demonstrated in 1875 that the conjugation of both nuclei after the fertilization, that is, the nucleus from the uh, egg and the nucleus from the sperm, uh, and all that was needed was a single spermatozoon for that to happen. And then there were a number of observations on insect pollination that also influence the way we think about heredity today. This insect pollination was a phenomenon discovered by the uh, English uh, botanist Philip Miller in 1721. And in 1795, Christian Conrad Springle, a German, uh, published a classical treatise on insect pollination that emphasized that plants with flowers needed to be pollinated by animals and advanced an elegant explanation about coevolution. In other words, as the plants develop new types of uh, sexual means to attract insects, the insects adapted to those, to those means, and therefore pollination was widespread. He said, One must investigate the flowers in their natural environment. One must try to catch nature in the act. Also major contributions were uh, made by plant breeders in the 17th and 18th centuries. Cotton Mather, for example, an American from New England, described in 1716 uh, spontaneous crosses in maize and other plants demonstrating that pollen is essential for the formation of seed in maize. Other hybridizers, like Thomas Fairchild and the French Guyot, uh, came up with similar conclusions. And Col Reuter, he was the first to undertake systematic hybridization experiments in plants. He carried about 500 hybridizations with 138 species of plants. No real hybrid was fertile. However, when he tried to backcross, there was a certain degree of ferti fertility. What this means is when he was using some of the descendants and making them to mate, uh, so to speak, with the ancestors, some fertility could take place. And that was very intriguing for everybody. Carl Reuter also found that the F1 generation, that is the first generation after reproduction, crosses were almost completely uniform and intermediate between the parents, and he will demonstrate that blending inheritance. But he also described correctly the characteristics of the F2 generation, that is the 
second generation after the parents, and vary it between the two P form, the parental forms. He also demonstrated that hybrids do not produce a third species. He established the significance of sex, fertilization, and refuted preformation. And finally, the Spanish Felix de Azara. He uh, observed animal hybrids and published about uh, those observations in 1801. William Herbert, an Englishman, investigated if the fertility of hybrids could be used as a criterion for membership in the same or different species, in many ways preceding the ideas that had to do later with the biological species concept. Only individuals of the same species can produce and reproduce, although we know there are many exceptions to that rule. He concluded that the fact that hybrid offspring whether the fertile or sterile are produced, and that establishes that both individuals used in the cross have a common origin in the same genus, and that there was no sharp dividing line between varieties and species. Then Thomas Andrew Knight, an Englishman who worked with peas, who described dominance and segregation in back crosses, but did not count the different kinds of seeds and thus did not calculate the ratios. This put him really uh, close to Mendel, but never was able to really determine what was going on in there. The same happened with the Italian Giorgio Galesio, who first employed the term dominant, John Goss, Englishman, Alexander Seaton, uh, Thomas Lexton, an Englishman, Louis de Villemorin, a Frenchman, and his son, Henry de Villemorin, who reported these findings in 1879, but never coming up with the actual mathematical ratios for that. Then we have Arden Wigmant, a German, and the French Augustine Sageret, uh, who observed the dominant segregation but never explained those phenomena, much less work on the ratios, so no mathematics. And Carl Friedrich from Garner, a German, summarized in 1849 the results of nearly 10,000 separate crossings experiments in about 700 species yielding 250 hybrids. He observed regularities among hybrids, but failed to enunciate any law, as many would do later on. Then we have Charles Nodin, a Frenchman, who published his accounts between 1855 and 1869. He studied a series of crosses involving several genera of plants. He emphasized the identity of reciprocal hybrids in relative uniformity of F1, as contrasted with the great uh, variability in F2. He saw the recombination of parental differences in F2, but there was no analytical approach, no ratios were recognized, although the, he obtained that according to his notes, and no simple and testable interpretations were developed. The expression, in fact, of laws of Nadal Mendel, sometimes seen in the literature, is wholly unjustified. The same can be said about other researchers who came up with similar numbers but never analyzed them properly, like the DA. Cotron uh, from France, and M. Pichura uh, from Germany. These and other plant breeders, such as Agustin Segeret, failed to think in population terms and to ask questions about the underlying mechanisms. That would not take place on Tim Mendel. Enter Mendel. Johann Gregor Mendel. He was an Austrian, although at that time he was part of the uh, Austrian Hungarian uh, Empire. Uh, his father was a small, poor peasant farmer. Uh, so poor um, that, despite the fact that Gregor Mendel was so interested in uh, schooling, in getting education, his father could not afford that. At the end of the day, a younger sister of Mendel voluntarily gave up a large part of her dowry to pay for Johann's education. The garden of the house in, in Retze, uh, where Gregor Mendel was born, can be seen in this picture. He entered the Augustinian order. Uh, if you were very poor at that time, one of the few ways out of poverty was to become an uh, order minister. He assumed the name of Gregor on becoming a monk and was ordained as a priest in 1847. That's a, a costume that the Augustinian monks still have today to change their first name to another name. He lived at the Abbey 
of uh, St. Thomas in Bern, Christo de Colberno. Since the Augustinians supplied teachers for the Austrian schools, uh, Mendel was sent to the University of Vienna in 1851 for training in mathematics and science. In 1854, he became a science teacher at the Bern Reichsschule. After failing three times to pass examinations that would allow him to teach in more advanced school, he had to uh, relinquish his teaching position and assume in 1868 the position of an abbot at his monastery. Many already much engaged with his experiments hoped that he might have more time for his research than when he was a teacher at the real Schule. This is the picture of today's library at the monastery. We have a very well endowed library, in fact, they have many books that uh, uh, Mendel used constantly for his own work. Mendel was particularly interested in math and botany, combining the two for his research. For eight years, beginning in 1857, he grew peace in a monastery garden. He published in 1866 in the Proceedings of the Natural History of Brun, today Berno, his classical paper. This paper, if you read it carefully, is an excellent example of a work where objectives are clearly set, data is presented concisely, and conclusions are formulated cautiously. He was influenced by this by his professor at the University of Vienna, Franz Unger, who in 1852, at the time that Mendel was one of his students, had embraced the idea that evolution could take place by the production of varieties from the normal variation found in among species. Mendel set out a population analysis program, rather than an individual one, in which he took into consideration each and every one of the individuals of each generation of hundreds of thousands of seeds and plants over eight planting seasons. More importantly, he was fascinated with the numerical relationship he had getting out of these results. This was particularly due to his training in physics. Christian Doppler, of the famous Doppler effect, was one of his teachers. So here we find someone who basically had a mathematical training applied to his results in biology, someone that no other person at that time had. He had read Alvin Garner, which convinced him that the piece uh, was the right subject to use for his studies because A, they possess um, constant uh, different traits, B, the hybrids can be protected from being pollinated by pollen from other plants, and C, they have no marked reduction in the fertility of the hybrids. Mendel follow hypothetical deductive method, which is what the science is done today, but it was not that much at that time. The basic hypothesis he tested was that for each heritable trait, a plant can produce two kinds of egg cells and two kinds of pollen grains. Each represented either the parental or the maternal character if they were different. Carefully, he self-pollinated various plants, wrapping them to guard against accidental pollination by insects, making sure in this way that if any characteristics were inherited, they would be inherited from only one single parent. He carefully saved the seeds produced by each self-pollinated pea plant, planted them separately, and studied the new generation. He hybridized two plants that vary in each well-defined trait round versus angular for wrinkled seeds, yellow versus green in terms of seed color, white seed coat versus grade one, and long versus short stems, etc. He found that if he planted seeds from dwarf pea plants, only dwarf pea plants sprouted. The seed produced by this second generation also produced only dwarf pea plants. The dwarf plants were what he called quote, bread true. Seeds from tall pea plants did not always behave in quite this way. Some tall pea plants, about a third of those in his garden, bred true, producing tall pea plants generation after generation. The rest, however, did not. Of these, 
Some seeds produce tall plants and some dwarf plants. There were always about three times as many tall plants produced by these seeds as dwarf plants. Apparently then, there were two kinds of tall tree plants, the true breeders and the non-true breeders. Mendel went a step further. He crossbred dwarf plants with two breeding tall plants and found that every resulting hybrid seed produced a tall plant. The characteristic of dwarfness seems to have disappeared. Next, Mendel self-pollinated each hybrid plant and studied the results. They were all the true non-breeding type. About one quarter of these seeds of each plant developed into a true breeding dwarf plants. One quarter developed into true breeding tall plants. One half developed into non-true breeding tall plants. Apparently, non-true breeding tall plants contain within themselves the characteristics of both tallness and dwarfness. When both characteristics were present, only tallness showed. It was dominant. Dwarfness, however, although recessive and not visible, was not eradicated. When the characteristic appeared in some plants in the next generation and unaccompanied by the tallness characteristic, the plants were dwarfs. In similar fashion, Mendel studied characteristics other than height. He was able to show that in every case, mixture of characteristics did not blend onto intermediateness but retained their own identity. He showed that pairs of characteristics combined and sorted themselves out according to fixed and rather simple rules. Apparently, both male and female parents contributed equally a factor governing each particular trait and the pairs of factors in the offspring did not blend but remained distinct. He found that the first hybrid population, the F1, was uniform regarding the character of one of the parents, which he called dominant, for example, round seeds, yellow cotyledon, gray coat, long stems, while he called the other character recessive. When the F1 hybrids were self-fertilized, the F2 generation showed this recessive characters with a ratio roughly of 3 to 1, or it's 3 dominant per 1 recessive. When he further self-fertilized F2 plants, he found that those showing the recessive character kept showing it all the way, but when he crossed the one showing the dominant one, the ratio of dominant versus recessive was 3 to 1. Again, the same result with the F3 generation. These results were obtained again and again up to the 6th generation. Thus, Mendel's discoveries were exceptional, especially if we take into consideration that the cytological knowledge, that is, the knowledge of the cells that was necessary to understanding them fully, was not developed until after many years later. Now, <coughs> nothing really happened when Mendel published his work. Why was his work neglected or unknown? First, he only published two papers in his life, so he was not regarded as a forefront scientist, a consummate professional in science. The publication he chose as a venue for his paper, although being distributed among many important libraries, was not the most respected of its time. The only scientist with whom he maintained correspondence, Negeli, was a believer in blending inheritance, discouraging Mendel to pursue his line of work and also snub him when he later published his influential work on plant hybrids. Mendel also was a profoundly modest and prone to depression bout person with many panic disorders. Actually, this panic disorders is what has been used to uh, explain why he failed in the examination that he took to become a certified P teacher. And he always was so poor. And despite his mathematical knowledge, he played the lottery. That gives you an indication that although he knew that the chances for him to win it was infinitesimal, he was so desperate for money that he kept playing the lottery. 
Now, Mendel's work was tremendously important. Uh, Darwin's theory of evolution by the means of natural selection had one overwhelmingly weakness. Darwin envisioned natural variations arising in each generation of a species, which is true, and natural selection seizing upon those variations to preserve the good and doom the bad, also true. However, the action of natural selection was slow and if, in the meantime, through unrestricted and random mating, the varying characteristics melted into intermediacy upon what would natural selection exert its effect? That was a big question. In other words, how can you explain variation within the same species? Mendel's discovery that varying characteristics did not blend but remain distinct showed that natural selection could work slowly and still effectively upon natural variation. Mendel might have pointed all this out, for he had read Charles Darwin's Origin of Species that was in the library in the monastery, and was even interested enough to annotate his copy. Nevertheless, when the time came for him to write up his experiments, he never mentioned Darwin. Mendel wrote up the results of his experiments carefully, but when he read them to the local society, of natural history, he made no impression at all. There was no discussion. There were no questions. Those who are acquainted with the magnitude of the task will appreciate that it has taken some strength of will to attempt the detailed experiments required to formulate such a law. A final decision can only be reached when the results of equally detailed experiments on plants of the most diverse form become available. But the precise numerical relationships which have now been demonstrated with peas must be regarded as being highly significant. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mendel, for that extremely detailed account of what has obviously been a lengthy and painstaking piece of research. If there are any questions on points you would like to raise, I know Mr. Mendel is prepared to deal with them. Of course. If you feel there is anything that needs further clarification, Conscious of his own status as an unknown amateur scientist, he felt that it would be wise to obtain the interest and the sponsorship of some well-known botanists. And that's how, in the early 1860s, he sent up his paper to Karl Negeli, a uh, German, uh, who was the nearest uh, of the prominent botanists of the time in the world. Negeli glanced through the paper, but apparently was repelled by the mathematics. Probably the same thing that happened with the audience when he presented his paper. Negley was an old-fashioned biologist who indulged in rather obscure theorization. A paper by an unknown monk with uh, no theories but only painstaking counts and ratios seemed worthless to him. Negley returned the paper to Mendel with brief and cold comments, and that effectively chilled Mendel. Negley offered to grow some Mendel seeds, but he never did, and the offer was probably not meant seriously. Negley did not answer Mendel's later letters, and when Negley wrote his major work on evolution, 20 years later, he did not mention Mendel whatsoever. Third, he put on weight and found it difficult to do the bending that was required in cultivating his piece properly. He kept up amateur interest in meteorology, maintaining careful records uh, of the daily weather. So, why Mendel stopped doing research? First, Negeli cold reception had disheartened him, as did the indifference of the naturalists in Berno. Second, he was appointed abbot of the monastery in 1868, and his administrative duties left him little spare time taking up the issue of what he believed was discriminatory tax legislation concerning religious institutions on the part of the Austrian government. <laughs> 
But Mendel has still famously said. Even took he hard to go through a number of bitter times in my life. He must thankfully own that the players and the good prevailed. My scientific work brought him a great deal of satisfaction, and I am convinced that it will not be long before the whole world acknowledges it. Mendel's work remain ignored and unnoticed. Few people look through the rather obscure journal in which Mendel's paper appeared, and those who did were either at home in botany, but not in mathematics. Darwin died in 1882, never knowing that the greatest weakness of his theory has been patched up. Mendel died in 1884, lonely and sad. Most of his papers were burned by his successor at the monastery, thinking they were just trash. Are those the last, Father Clements? Yes, Father Abbott. Perhaps the Natural Science Society would like to have them. Some of them might be important. Important? No, I hardly think so. Take them away. Give them to Joseph. Tell him... Tell him to burn them on his bonfire. In the deceased, the poor have lost a benefactor and mankind a most noble character. To us, in the Bruno Natural Science Society, his passing is an irreplaceable loss. I particularly recall how every spare moment afforded by his fortunate position was spent on detailed natural scientific studies. Father Mendel displayed a totally independent and special way of thinking. All his studies took on practical significance. He did not confine himself to lifeless words, but efficaciously intervened at each opportunity in the agricultural affairs of Moravia. Much credit is due to him for his work on the breeding of fruit trees, flowers. His experiments in plant hybridization were no less than epoch-making. Negeli died in 1891 never dreaming what a terrible mistake he had made. But things were about to change, and that is what we will be talking about in the next and final chapter in this brief history of genetics class. So stay tuned. Hello again. Now we go to the last final chapter of this course on the history of classical genetics. Three scientists rediscovered the work of Mendel almost simultaneously, the Fries, Korens, and Chermark, and this is their incredible stories. In the spring of 1900, three noted naturalists, Hugo de Fries, Karl Korens, and Erik von Chermark, within a period of few months published statements that they had independently discovered certain laws of inheritance, only to find, when checking the literature, that Mendel had anticipated them by 35 years. Mendelism has been divided into two periods, from 1900 to 1909 and to 1910 to the current time. The first is dominated by the Fries, William Bateson and Wilhelm Johansen. Hugo Marie de Vries was a Dutch scientist who studied botany under Julius von Sach, earned his medical degree in 1870, and in 1878 became professor of botany at the University of Amsterdam. Some of you may think that how come this uh, medical doctor became a botanist? Well, the fact of the matter is that at that time, botany and medicine were very close in academic circles. Botany basically was seen as a source of medicine. 
The Fries devoted a great deal of thought to Darwin's theory of evolution. He saw that the great flaw in it was that there was no explanation on how individuals may vary. Yet, it was only on that unexplained manner of variation that the changes of evolution could, in turn, be explained. De Vries devised a theory of how different characteristics may vary independently of each other and recombine in many different combinations. This, in fact, amounted to a rediscovery of Mendel's findings. In 1900, he had done enough work on plants to feel sure that the rules he had worked out were correct. Before publishing, he went back over the literature to see what, if anything, existed on the subject. He was amazed when he came across the papers by Mendel and found his own laws work out in full detail a generation earlier. The freeze was able to go beyond Mendel, however, in one respect, thanks to an accidental discovery made in 1886. The American evening primrose had been introduced to the Netherlands a few years earlier. The freeze, out on a walk, came across a colony of these plants growing in a waste meadow. It did not take the sharp eye of a botanist to see that some were widely different from others. He bought them back and bred them separately and together and found the same results that Mendel had found. But he also found that occasionally a new variety differing markedly from the others would grow and that this new variety would perpetuate itself in future generations. The Fries proposed a new doctrine of evolution by sudden jumps or mutations, which is the Latin word meaning to change. This sort of thing had always been known to herdsmen and farmers, who had frequently seen the production of freaks or sports. Evolution ceased to be an infinitely slow process that could be theorized about but not observed. Here it went under the freeze very eyes. The forming of new varieties could be expected and experimentation with evolution could proceed. Some freak characteristics had even been used, as for instance, the short leg breed of sheep that due to a mutation in 1791 could not jump over fences and was therefore useful and was preserved. Furthermore, Several 19th century evolutionists, such as Thomas Huxley and Negeli, had suggested evolution by jumps, but without evidence. Unfortunately, herdsmen do not usually draw theoretical conclusions from their observations or tell scientists about them, nor did scientists involve themselves often enough in the 19th century with the mechanics of herding to test their theories. It was not until 1901 that theory and observation met in the person of the Fries. By rediscovering the Mendelian laws of inheritance and adding to them his own theory of mutation, the Fries plugged the hole in Darwinian theory and successfully completed its structure. The Hugo de Fries mutation theory can be condensed as follows. Living organisms can develop changes to their genes that greatly alter the organisms. In other words, mutation. In the same year, in 1900, two other botanists, one in Germany and one in Austria, unknown to the Fries and to each other, each had a work out the laws of inheritance. Each had searched through the literature and had come across Mendel's papers. It is one of the most curious chapters in scientific history that not one of them uh, made any efforts to claim credit for a discovery that intellectually at least was independently their own and which would have meant great fame. Each man with the ideal of integrity of the true scientist announced Mendel's discovery and introduced his own work 
only as a confirmation. The second man was Carl Erich Korens. This German, like De Vries, engaged in a line of research which by 1900 had led him to the independent elucidation of the laws of genetics, then discovered Mendel's earlier work and published his own merely as a confirmation. Because he had been anticipated, Korens lost his chance at fame. He served his last two decades of his life, however, as director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Biology in Berlin. Erich von Chermark, an Austrian, he was a breeder from an early age, and he worked with the progenies of P crosses. These observations and the result of some back crossing procedures in which parental characters appear in a one-to-one -one segregation scheme when the hybrids were crossed again with their parental types formed the basis of his doctoral dissertation, which he delivered in 1900. The freeze not always gave Mendel its full due in subsequent publications, and Corinth was about the same. However, Chermark was more forceful by saying that only Mendelism could provide, quote, a new rational basis, unquote, for the breeding of new constant forms of plants by hybridization. Then we have William Bateson. This English biologist obtained his master's degree from Cambridge, and he was a key figure in the radical mutationism backlash against war Darwinism beginning in the 1890s. In other words, he was critical of Darwin by saying Darwin doesn't believe that it is possible that big changes can occur out of nowhere. And he was right. He was one of the first to accept the Mendelian laws that were rediscovered and reinterpreted in 1900. He popularized Mendelian genetics in Britain and discovered linkage, that is the effect that one gene can have to a nearby gene in the same chromosome. In 1905, experiments he conducted on Mendelian inheritance show that not all characteristics are independently inherited. Some characteristics are inherited together, and this gene linkage was eventually explained by the American Thomas Hunt Morgan. Based on coin in 1901, the terms allele, originally allelomorph, that is, different forms of the same gene, heterozygote, when you find variety in the uh, genetic composition of a particular individual, and homozygote when they find the same characteristics from a genetic viewpoint, and in 1906, the term genetics. Thus, he provided a lot of the terminology most used in today's classical genetics. Bateson was the first ever to hold a professional position at Cambridge in this new field of genetics, so he was the first chair of genetics anywhere in the world. And he said, famously, Treasure your exceptions. When they are none, the work gets so dull that no one cares to carry it further. Keep them always uncovered and in sight. Exceptions are like the rough rock work of a growing building which tells that there is more to come and shows where the next construction is to be. This is, by the way, a quote I always give to my students because it opens their eyes to look at those exceptions. They may be very, very useful in terms to gain insights on a particular discovery. And then we have William Ernest Castle, an American. He was one of the earliest experimental geneticists. In his 1901 paper, he was the first that talked about Mendelism in America. And his studies in inbreeding showed that the interactions among, quote, modifier and, quote, genes could create previous unseen variation, something that has been confirmed since then very clearly. He pioneered in 1905 the use of Drosophila in genetics, the fruit fly, but worked mostly on rodents. And by the way, fruit fly continues to be a top subject of research in Mendelian genetics and classic genetics in general. Initially, he was an eugenicist. In other words, someone who believed that the human race could be improved by eliminating individuals that were not that desirable. And that happened in the early 20s, before turning against the movement a few years later. 
along with most American geneticists. And then we have Wilhelm Ludwig Johansen. This Danish scientist uh, coined in 1909 the term gene from the Greek word that means to give birth to. The suggestion was adopted immediately, and from it, other words such as genotype arose. He is another example of those scientists whose fame in the history of science rests chiefly on the invention of a word. Now, what has happened since then? A lot of things have happened, and we don't have the time to talk about that in this present course. But let's just think about eugenics that I mentioned earlier. It was a very strong movement and that uh, was created in the United States. It was taken to a, a higher negative uh, level uh, by the Nazis in Germany. And uh, today there are some people who think along those terms. So that's a topic that we may discuss in another course sometime in the future. Lysenkoism. There was a view of genetics as something that can be very Lamarckian in the sense of creating that environment was everything that was very popular in the former Soviet Union for political reasons. And that, again, may be another topic for discussion later on. And then the issue of boutique babies. With the tools that we have today, we are in danger of parents wanting to engineer, so to speak, their babies. And that can have a lot of very dangerous consequences. And of course, DNA. DNA is the most famous molecule in the world. And certainly, it, this could be a great topic of discussion for another course in this section of history of science and biology in academia. If you are interested in learning more about some of these topics, you can look at my bi uh, book on cave biology that contains a lot of information on the genetics of cave uh, animals. And also uh, some of the papers I have written on the history and philosophy of science that also deals with the history of genetics in general. If you have any questions, if you are interested in some other information, please uh, contact me through my uh, URL. You see the address there to the bottom left of this slide. And I hope you enjoy this course on the brief history of classical genetics from myth to science. And I hope to see you again for another course in these areas of biology and history. So stay tuned.